Hey, you guys can check out the brand new special South Park, not suitable for children, exclusively now on Paramount Plus. And if you don't have Paramount Plus, do not sweat it because you can try it free on us for 30 days with code Butter. Click the link in the description below to check it out. It is one of the funniest specials I've come across all year. It has a great commentary on consumerism, which I think is timely for this time of year, especially given the fact that we're getting ready to do a podcast about a Christmas movie on Rare Exports. But you guys can uh, not only stream this South Park special, but you guys can also stream other South Park specials that have been made for the platform, as well as live TV, movies you can't see anywhere else, nostalgic hits from Nickelodeon, MTV, Comedy Central, and more. Click the link in the description and use code BUTTERS for 30 days for free. Hey, you are listening to Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast where we celebrate all things spooky and mental health. I'm your co-host, Mark. And I'm your co-host, Josh. And this is part one to our annual crossover with our friends over at Collateral Cinema Podcast. We're going to be covering Rear Exports. We're joined by Mr. Ashley Chancellor. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thank you for being enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can see my uh, my hoodie. <laughs> Barely. Hell yeah. <laughs> but if you guys want to see Ash's hoodie, you guys, all you got to do is join our Patreon at the $5 tier. And that money also helps us bring mental health resources and education into uh, things like film festivals, comic cons, horror cons community centers, after school programs, and more. That's patreon.com forward slash victims and villains. Tis the season. So Mark, what are we what is sliding down our chimney for the our first part of this crossover? That sounds kind of wrong the way you say that. <laughs> well Santa's in <laughs> captivity, so no, so we checked out rare exports. It's just kind of awesome. Was this a first time watch for any of you guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just watched this movie really today. I yeah, same here. I admit I thought this movie was much older than what it was. Uh, similar to our last episode with Adam Chaplin, we thought that one was like, you know, like New. late nineties. Oh yeah. wow! Well, mm-hmm. I, I thought it was it- older. Then the or we they, did think it was newer. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, this is backwards. the way they advertised it, we thought it was newer, but it ended up being older, but it was still a bloody good time. But you guys can start currently stream this on uh Screenbox among other platforms. But Ash being our guest for this one, what did you think of this movie? Oh man, this movie was actually a lot of fun. It was a neat little take on uh the origins of Santa kind of getting into some of the more darker uh, Christmas stories that aren't told a lot anymore. The whole, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I loved the whole concept. I liked the, it, just, it was just very visceral. Okay. Mark, what do you think about this movie? So it's pretty awesome. It's good. It's fun. Um, I like the concept. I wish there had been more blood and gore. That's my only real complaint. Yeah. So I will say this, that I, A, I think this movie could have been longer and messed out some of the, the pacing issues I had with the first probably 20 or 20 30 minutes of this movie but well, it's like an hour and 20 minute movie yeah which <laughs> I, I wish that they kind of would have done a little bit more with kind of like the digging grew i felt like they were like a nice opening and then like it felt like they didn't really get to see anything until like the end of the uh 
or like the middle of the movie. It just kind of seemed like they came in a little bit too late. I thought this movie was just okay. I feel like for all the hype that has been in existence about this movie, I expect it way more like on the level of something like, you know, Silent Night, yeah, Deadly Night, you know, something a little bit more like of that camp or that cheese that like a lot of people talk the way that a lot of people talk about this movie. I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> it, it it is pretty short. And it doesn't go as far as you might expect something like this to. But I did think that it reached a level of disturbing that was pretty interesting. So I will give you that because this movie, I feel like for like one of the things that Mark and I, we've we've been doing this for two years now. And like every time that we get to like talking about Christmas movies, it's always like every time we get you get to like the uh the evil Santa, it's always like the same exact thing. Like Christmas, bloody Christmas, he was evil but a robot. Like, you know, it's a wonderful <laughs> knife that we covered earlier this year. Like there are there are Christmas movies that we've covered that I'm just kind of like it's repetitive, it's getting tired. Like I liked the the aspect of like the mythology of Christmas and how it's portrayed here. I thought that was really refreshing. And I was like, I really wish that you got to see stories like this way more than what we've seen uh, stateside. Yeah, it's it's different. I mean, I kind of like the village. I watched the movie a lot like I'd like to visit there. It seems quiet, but then you have like people terrorizing them. So it's a conflicted train of thought. (laughs) (laughs) You okay, Josh? Mark, (laughs) you and me are like completely opposite, like in terms of stuff like that, because I like being around. A, a bunch of people and like I've tried rural life and like living in kind of like secluded areas it doesn't work for me this does not work for me it it drives my mental health absolutely bananas there's something to be said about peace and quiet and being able to scream get off my lawn and able to reinforce it <laughs> I mean as somebody from a small rural town um it has its advantages and disadvantages. I don't like being around a whole lot of people, but that means that the few people here are of questionable character. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. So, like, take take the character, uh, you know, our our central character, Pietre. If I if I say uh, that name wrong, I'm sorry. It. How would you guys say it? Does Does that sound about right, Pietre? I don't know. Um, uh, I think is what Uh, he said I'm just going to call him Pi uh, because the way that it's spelled (laughs) here is is, I would spell it Pytari yeah let's just call him the kid I'm pretty sure it's I'm pretty sure it's anyways anyways (laughs) P we'll just call him P the kid kid the P (laughs) Uh, you know, like being like secluded in in that kind of area, like I can't speak to that not being a parent myself and not wanting to be a parent. But I got to imagine that like to some regards, like being raised in an area like that, you can definitely see like it. How do I say like hinders your growth? But like it seems like that's kind of what the film hints at because, you know, the very few kids that this village does have all seem to have kind of broken that, you know, the idea and the concept that Santa Claus isn't real. But then you have Pietri or however you say his name, like <laughs> uh, it's still believing and like still holding on to hope. Like the fact that like he has like a bunker dedicated to like watching. And like there are those moments where like he sees the footsteps in the snow and he's like, it was Santa Claus. Well, in those I... kind of, in those kind of villages though, um, 
especially more so overseas and like Europe and Asia, the younger they are, the more responsible they are than we are here. I mean, that's a given. Uh, but I think he was the younger of all the kids involved in the movie. I think he was the youngest yeah. of the bunch, too. He seemed that way. I did, did either of you think it was weird how quickly they believed him that it was Santa Claus? That's what I'm telling you, man. Like it was like kind of like it's like the pacing. They're like, all right, we shit. He's just gonna believe that this is Santa Claus. Like there's not gonna be like no questions or anything. Like it, it's Santa Claus. And then like that's my other issue with this film is that as soon as they believe him, this movie just kind of seems to like take all of the adults and like turn them on the, the its head. So like he was kind of like the runt of the, the litter. Funeral. Yeah, he was kind of like the <laughs> runt of the litter. St- stated that it was Santa Claus and then now somehow is like the actual leader of the entire like village operation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somebody's got to do it. Why not? I mean, old? <laughs> <laughs> you know, was it just me or were there no moms? In fact, I don't think there was a single female character in this movie. Where are the moms? Uh, there were a couple, I think, up in the um, mining camp, one or two. In like okay. one scene or something, I think. Or am I wrong? I could be wrong. Uh, I mean, and they seem to imply that the mom is gone in that one scene between Same. uh Dad's son. Whatever the fuck his name is. And <laughs> <laughs> what's his uh, name uh, and other what's his name? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah, the, the dad's name is like Renato. And man, uh, Rono Bob Renero, yeah. I, I got the Wikipedia pulled up, but that's what I got pulled up too. And I'm just like, that I this movie, it should be also of note that this movie is like Norwegian or or comes from Finnish, Norway, right? Finnish, yeah, one of the I two. I thought it was Finnish, yeah. So it is okay, so it is Finnish. Um, but it. Fun fact, it is actually uh, a production over four countries, including Finland, Norway, France, and Sweden. Well, I do know somebody that's like from that region. And what kind of made it interesting is apparently raising like reindeer is very big over there. And you don't go hunt. Yeah, you don't go hunting for them. Because they probably belong to somebody, and you might end up losing everything if you take one out without permission. Huh. So I thought that was interesting from somebody I know. So. Well, obviously, I think this is kind of more like a chillax episode. <laughs> uh, we saved all of the heavy conversations for Eyes Wide Shut. Did we <laughs> really? Coming up. <laughs> Did God. Mark, 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 you don't you don't know how prepared I am for this episode for that episode. <laughs> I mean, you got to be for Kubrick, right? Took notes Do upon you? notes upon notes upon notes. I went through like a, a like a two hour rabbit hole last night of just YouTube videos and like caught conspiracy theories about them. <laughs> nice. but you, you guys, you guys can check that out on the Collateral Cinema podcast feed uh, in a couple of days, but. Ash, you brought up a, a really interesting point about, like, uh, you know, the fact that he believes it. Like, what about this, like, the tycoon that we meet in the the beginning of the movie that is, like, like maybe, like, 60s and 70s that is, like, actively hunting for Santa Claus and well into adulthood? It's I mean, like he, Homeboy yeah. must have seen something during his life that uh, turned everything around for him. I don't know. He saw mommy kissing more than just Santa Claus. And he's looking for his payback. Yeah. That's my guess. I just, I don't know. To me, like, it just kind of seemed like a really weird <laughs> point of, like, cons- like contention for the, the narrative of this film to be, like, I don't know, man. It, it goes back to this, like, that idea of, like, the killing joke and Joker being like, you know, you're all one bad day away from being me. Like, I would love to know like what happened to like his character to like set him on this like 
lifelong conquest to be like, I'm going to find Santa and then eventually capture and or kill him. Like, it just seems like a really weird uh, thing. I don't I know. I mean, there's not a lot about the movie that actually makes sense. <laughs> there's really not. No. And I don't know that it's necessarily supposed to. I don't think you're supposed to dive too deep into it because, you know, then you have to wonder, like, if Santa has been frozen all these years, then like what's been going on for all of the time that the Santa mythos has been a thing. And then the the elves are apparently just like. Evil old men. Naked, evil, evil old cannibalistic men. old men. It, I almost texted our group chat as that, like, when they like started coming out of the snow, and I was like, that moment when Rare Exports becomes an A24 film. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I feel like, I feel like this movie, Mark, kind of feels a lot like Legend to me. The more that I talk about it, the more that I end up hating this movie just a little bit more. <laughs> be glad you're in Richmond and I can't smack you for hating Legend. so sorry I'm so sorry I'm so sorry you know what you'll be the black sheep on the eyes wide shut episode I'll, I'll be the black sheep on this episode that's fine there you go <laughs> I feel like I'm going to piss off a lot of people on that episode <laughs> well you know that's what podcasts are for they're for you know having uh putting out your unfiltered opinions to the world you know all the hot takes and everything <laughs> yeah hot takes i i was i was not a fan of this movie it was okay i liked it um i don't know if it's something that i would add to like my christmas repertoire every year or anything but i thought it was interesting it it, it definitely like provoked some thought and uh, apparently this was a, originally a short film although it, it's a pretty short film still yeah so this is actually a there's two short films that this movie it like is is from the first one is 2003 rare exports inc and then 2005 it's uh rare exports the official safety instructions um both of which according to wikipedia both of which involve a company that traps wild Santa Clauses and trains and exports them to uh, locations around the world, which. So are we going with the fact that this movie induces, uh, um, endorses human trafficking? <laughs> that, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> you know, the end of it is like, you know the good guys won, and they managed to capture all the naked old men, and um, yeah, Start literally trafficking them around and, the world. Yeah, and and that's the good outcome, right? That's like everybody's happy. <laughs> the the children are smiling about it. I, I I did think that was a little odd. I don't know if that was on purpose. <laughs> I mean, at this point, like, I mean, Pietri like has to like have some sense of like trauma because there's like what two or three times where like he quite literally walks in on his dad like dismembering either a bear or an animal or and or a man like they're actually like trying uh, well, to like the man part i could see be traumatizing but i feel like in that kind of village and upbringing the dismemberment and and butchering of a animal would be somewhat normal Oh, well, I'm, pretty wouldn't think sure, so. uh, I'm pretty sure they're not going to the local grocery store to get meat. Well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> live quite a quite a while. Um, and again, no one's disturbed by the fact of them like shipping old people around the world. So I mean, the father tells the son. Peter, I'm just gonna call him Peter. <laughs> that's to, a great uh, compromise. I, I, that's probably the Americanized version of his name, right? Um, he tells him to uh, close his eyes when he's butchering the animal at the beginning. So, but you know, it's totally okay to to ship human people. <laughs> I, 
Yeah, this movie gives the wrong message because I mean, like, look, we've all been, we were all children, and like, you know, tell parents tell us not to do something. You're like, oh, well, if I not to do it, there's got to be a reason. So like, you're just kind of like peeking through your eyes, you know, one eye open, and you're just like, well, what am I missing? You know, kind of, you have that fear of FOMO like really early on. Yeah. Yeah, it, it honestly it makes you like kind of want to do it more. And I mean you see that. There's there's multiple moments throughout the film where the dad tells Peter to uh you know not do this, stay here, stay there, and he doesn't listen a single time. <laughs> uh I guess that worked out for everybody, but the the day I eventually ended up to like, you know, human trafficking and like I guess village peace for the village it's just this movie's very very bizarre let me just say that abyss gazing does not condone or support human trafficking in any way shape or form so yeah either just victims and villains because i mean it's a it's a serious thing and like i don't know movies like this like kind of make really light of it and it's just kind of messed yeah. up honestly yeah, I mean, this came I, out in 2010. I had heard a lot about this movie and how much people loved it. And I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It was a brainless fun movie, but I was really yeah. surprised that with they when they talk about human trafficking these days that this doesn't get mentioned at the end. Like, how could you put out a movie where they're like cashing in off shipping old men around the world for Christmas? <laughs> Yeah. What you get for Christmas, son? I got an old man with a beard. It's yeah. <laughs> it's at least they're clothes. I mean, it's when, it's when up they there. ship them out. It's not as bad as like the toy with Richard Pryor in the eighties, but still, it's pretty bad. What I think is interesting is like in terms of like traumatic like movies, this movie came out the same year as uh one of the most controversial films with a Siberian film. Um and a that Serbian movie is film? Oh, yeah. a Serbian film, yeah, that one. Jeez. That movie is constantly in in conversations. Yeah. It's like a year away. It's like Human Centipede came either a year before or a year after this one. Um yeah. Very, still, very weird. I still haven't seen a Serbian film. I'm I have not, not actually seen sure it. that I want to. Me neither. Because I don't want enough, to, but I've heard somebody... enough about it that it's like, do I really want to see this? Where with the human right. centipede, it was like, you have to watch the human centipede. Why? Just trust me. You have to watch the human centipede. Why? Don't worry about it. Just go watch it. <laughs> That's kind it's of not even that was. good. <laughs> It has Something the tells slowest, me. it has the the slowest chase scene in like movie history. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, what, that's what films... you remember from that one. <laughs> and feed her, it, feed her. It's one of those films that, and I, and I think the Human Centipede also is up there. But a Serbian film definitely is. I think it's one of those films, though, that like, even though I don't necessarily want to see it and I don't think that I'm going to like it or, you know, even kind of like see any kind of artistic value in it from what I've heard. It's still one of those movies that's like as a as a movie fan, as a as a guy on a movie podcast, I guess at some point I have to check it off the list. But <laughs> the crossover for next year has been done. A Serbian film in the human side. <laughs> <laughs> No. I've got some I've got some trivia for you guys here. Uh so father and son in this movie, Pietre and Rano Rano Rano, however you say his name, are actually real life father and son. So they're real life offspring. Huh. And you know, I thought that the relationship between them was um one one of the better done parts of this movie, because you could tell that this like there's some issues, but, you know, he genuinely cares about his kid and he wants to protect his kid. And you know what I mean? Even though he's a little, you know, like, oh, let me just push you to the side. <laughs> and I, like, I can't always speak to this as a as a as a man, a still married with a 
with a living wife not widowed or anything but be also at the same time like uh you know not also not having any kids but like i have plenty of friends who are single parents and they always kind of share their struggles and especially around this time of year with christmas like i you could tell that like there are moments where the film like really shows the emotional baggage that he has as a father doing this and it kind of almost you could argue that like maybe mom died recently or left within like the last year and this is it's kind of almost seems like it's the first christmas because you know he doesn't really seem to like know how to like operate as a standalone parent the fact that like there are two meal sequences and he feeds his kid both times gingerbread cookies like as like the the Mm -hmm. substance and it's it's during one of those scenes, he burns the bejesus out of the food. Yes. He did try to make something, right? And, he did. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't for lack of trying. It was yeah, but... For lack of ability. It, it, it like... hammers home the fact that he's may, maybe recently a single parent. You know? There was some, kind of somebody else who was taking care of these kinds of things. And I'm one of those friends that you could... Uh, you, you that, that can relate to that, like you were saying, you know? A uh, single parent around Christmas time. There's definitely a struggle. Although you know, mine isn't dead. She, you know, we're just we're just not together. So it's, it's a little bit better, but yeah. And I mean, like, I just I I don't know. I I have a lot of like like you said, like it it is rough and it it kind of sucks to hear, um, you know, stories like that that come around this time of year where it's like, you know, especially like with the last year you know just have, with inflation and, and corporate greed it just kind of seems like every yeah like dude i would be happy for people just to give me money for groceries like you know kind for of story <laughs> yeah yeah some grocery money would be nice uh, <laughs> i don't think anybody <laughs> refused that <laughs> these days this is uh this happens to be one of Kate Blanchett's favorite movies of all time. Oh. Um. Yeah, the last the last trivia fact I will give you guys at five minutes and forty five seconds there is an explosion on the mountain and uh, it, the resulting smoke takes on the form of two horns, foreshadowing later events in the movie. Oh. Huh. Which okay, I uh, didn't notice that, but if I ever rewatch this, I'll be on the lookout for it. <laughs> Mark, I feel like there's not a whole lot of uh, other things that we can talk about in this movie. Is there anything else that like really stuck out to you that you want to talk about? Or same question to you, Ash. Um, I wonder why Santa had such a crumpus like design i that's a great question because like the first time that they showed that i was kind of like oh i am immediately intrigued because my wife and i i just got to show my wife krampus the other day for the first time nice and uh she liked it go check out our episode on krampus but yeah i was kind of curious about that too because i was like this seems weird and maybe maybe it's a maybe it's a a finnish thing you know maybe in Finland, the concept of Santa is different than what it is here in America. You know, I was kind of confused about that as well, because when they were getting into some of the darker Santa stories, I was like, isn't that Krampus? Are they just like conflating the two figures? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? So according to I... Google... um. One way to tell if you are dealing with the official Santa Claus of Finland is to look at his hat. Unlike the less shadowy, the showy headpiece of his colleagues, his hat has a long uh, conic- conical conical uh, part decorated with a large red tuft at the end. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, it was it, it was a weird decision to to do that. Yeah. Well, okay then. I have no more <laughs> questions.
yeah i'm uh i'm like now i'm like in a rather hole of uh what Finnish Santa looks like. <laughs> um, but this is a this is a different language. Um I did find something from uh a website called Ink Tank that discusses it, but it is in a different language. Um so I don't know if you're of a listener of the show and you happen to be from Finland, what would it why this Santa look this way in this movie? But I think it's gonna do it for us on our portion of this year's Christmas crossover. But where can people find Collateral Cinema online? You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, uh, you name it. And if we're not somewhere, let us know so we can be there. Uh, and check us out on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, as mentioned previously, we are going to be uh, doing our side of the collateral crossover event with uh, I just eyes blanked out um, eyes wide shut. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. I just I had a I had a a, a little uh, brain fart. Marijuana uh, affects the memory. Yes. <laughs> That that would be the that would be an explanation. Um, eyes wide shut, and uh, also uh, check out our episodes this month uh, for Bad Movie December on Neil Breen's Twisted Pear and The Wicker Man, uh, the one with Nicolas Cage. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sure, Josh, you're going to uh, be checking out the uh, the Wicker, Wicker Man one, <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, so you guys can find us wherever you guys get your podcast from. Just look up Abyss Gazing, and uh, you guys can follow our parent company, Victims and Villains. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and wherever you guys get your podcast from, as well as Patreon. Mark, where can people find you online? Not really doing much at the moment, so he's he's modest. Go follow his painting stuff, he's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, titanium juggernaut painting on Instagram whenever I start posting paintings again. Nice. Well, he was working on something before we started recording tonight, so who knows? Yeah. But uh yeah, so you guys can follow me. I am on letterbox at Captain Nostalgia. And you guys can uh follow me on my other podcasts, as Ash said, I'm a huge Nicholas Cage fan. So of course I'm the co host of our Nick Cage podcast. Uh, that's high praise. We'll be back in the new year. This is the last episode for us this year, 2023. So thank you guys for listening from the start of this year, covering Megan all the way to now. Uh, thank you guys for being along for the weird, wonderful world of abyss gazing. We'll see you guys next year. And remember, the longer you gaze into the abyss, the more the abyss gazes back into you. Have a good night. If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because once again, you have value and you have worth. So please stay with us.